Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Aaron Newcomb joins me. We're going to be talking about CX, the language that powers the SkyCoin network. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Aaron Newcomb. Episode 536, recorded July 3rd, 2019, CX. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly. Give your users the seamless online experience they want. Power your site or app with Cashfly CDN, Content Delivery Network, and be 30% faster than the competition. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. And by DigitalOcean. Deploy and scale your app seamlessly on the simplest cloud platform. Join over 150,000 businesses that use DigitalOcean. Sign up today and receive a free $50 credit at do.co slash twit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, little projects, projects you may be using every day and totally unaware of it, projects you might want to download right after the show and play with. Today's probably one of those. Joining me once again is my lovely and talented co-host, uh, Aaron. Aaron Newcomb, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks, Randall. Glad to be here. Cool. And uh, you looks like you're in your uh, wife's half of the uh, maker space. Uh, yeah, my little uh, home office here that doubles as the makerspace. All the makerspace stuff is this way. You can't okay. see it. And well, I can't say that because all of my retro computers are some of my retro computers are stacked up in the back. The ones that I'm working on, I've been getting into vintage computers lately. And uh, so I think there's an Atari uh, 800 XL back there. There's wow. an original NES. I see a Commodore. Um, yeah, and some other stuff. So and this thing, which uh, I'll bring in. This little thing, which I just finished up, I'm very proud of it. Uh, My buddy saw this little uh, arcade thing that you hook up to the TV um, at a a Bed Bath & Beyond. And it's got a couple (laughs) buttons. It had this nice little kind of deep case here with like a real joystick or semi-real joystick on top. It has real switches inside. He's like, hey, could you put a Raspberry Pi in this and turn it into like a – uh, you know, so you can play any game. I was like, yeah, sure. So I just got done with that. That was kind of a fun project to do. I wish I had your spare time. <laughs> I don't even have anything close to that. Well, that's a, you know, I, I, I said I just got done. I, I, I didn't say it took me, it, it took me a, a small amount of time. I've been working on it probably for about three or four months, actually on and off. So, but it's nice awesome. when you get done, you feel like, oh, I did something. Yay. And I'm in the same place that I was last week, which is the what we call the Tijuana kitchen set. If you'll see the uh, refrigerator back there with the one magnet that's moved. And so far, nobody has discovered it yet. Nobody has told me about it yet, about which magnet has actually been moved, even though the rest of them have been in the same place for four years. I am uh, once again uh, south of the border, uh, practicing my Spanish, um, eating a lot of tacos and uh, other wonderful food. Occasionally pizza, though, oh, not on my diet, but I do it anyway. Um, and having a great time here. Uh, today, wonderful show, as it always is. We've got a couple of guests actually on today. Uh, we've got, uh, scroll, scroll, scroll. We've got uh, Amory Hernandez Aguila and Inge Wallen. Uh, hopefully I pronounced Inge's name right. I didn't ask about that. And they're going to be talking to us about CX. CX is a general purpose interpreted and compiled programming language with very strict type system and a syntax similar to Go. Uh, CX provides a new programming paradigm based on the concept of affordances, which I was trying to read through the documentation to see what that really was all about. The only thing I really, really know this is what this is about is that uh, they wanted to be on the show to talk about how they compile this down to um, essentially the Ethereum blockchain uh, language so that you can write contracts in CX for your um, uh, blockchain transfers and things like that. And uh, not just coins, but also like the whole idea of um, uh, being able to, say, have, uh, um, uh, say, consensus for a, a vote or something, things like that. This stuff, I mean, blockchain's interesting. I still think, I don't know, I'll, I'll, I might be convinced at the end of the show, but I still think I'm not quite convinced yet that we have the right problem set for blockchain yet but maybe these guys will convince me finally i still think it's like a an idea whose time has not yet come or an idea that never needed to be done i don't know we'll see (laughs) i'm i'm hoping our guests can can uh, lead a little bit to that uh aaron what do you know about this so far 
Uh, well, not much, but really only just what I've read. I'm kind of interested in, you know, why we need a programming language that focuses on blockchain. Um, I'm not really sure about that. And and also just, I mean, it, it is interesting back to your blockchain point. Um, you know, we have at work, you know, one of our customers is NASDAQ and they have a, it, they, they're using blockchain actually in, in production um, wow. for some of their customers. And every time I hear that, I think, wait a second, NASDAQ is using blockchain. Like it, it just, it just doesn't compute fully like why do you need to do that is it just because it's a buzzword and it's popular or is there there must be some benefit if you're using it in production that you're actually seeing from using blockchain and lots of other customers even in healthcare um i've talked to customers that are using blockchain uh, there's one that i i probably shouldn't mention a large um hmm. healthcare institution here in california um that's using blockchain for some stuff and i heard about it and i was like really really blockchain so it, it does surprise me how much it's coming up actually in production at large companies that are actually finding uses for this technology. So um, we'll see. Maybe you know, maybe it's time has come, or maybe it's a fad. Who knows? So that that'll be interesting because there's like multiple questions I really need answered before the end of the show here. So this is going to be really fun. But before we get into that, I do have a very important message because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly. Give your users a seamless online experience they want. Power your site or app with Cashfly CDN and be 30% faster than the competition. No matter what industry your business is in, if your website is directly tied to company revenue, give your customers the fast downloads they need with Cashfly. Cashfly CDN delivers rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods and up to 30% faster than other major CDNs. Backed by a 100% SLA, Cashfly guarantees the best user experience for all your customers, no matter where they are or what device they're on. Join the thousands of others who trust Cashfly's reliable network, including LG, Microsoft, Adobe, and Ars Technica. Say goodbye to logging in multiple times a week, or worse, even daily trying to track your CDN usage. No billing spikes. Get a custom plan tailored to your CDN needs based on yearly usage trends. On average, customers who switch to Cashfly save more than 20%. Just imagine what you could do with that 20% and your time. And just for Twit listeners, Cashfly is giving away a complimentary, detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and usage trends. See if you're overpaying 20% or more for CDN. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. That's twit.cashfly.com. And we thank Cashfly for their support of Floss Weekly. So let's go ahead and bring on our first guest. That would be uh, Amari Hernandez Aguia. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you. Hi. And where are you speaking to us from? Uh, I, I'm in Tijuana in the same city that, <laughs> that you are currently in. <laughs> 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 yeah, let me let me wave in your general direction. We talked before the show about where you actually were, so you're slightly down over there. So I'll wave in your general direction. Hello, and I'm waving. Also... <laughs> okay, good, good. Uh, I, I would see you waving, except we don't have a video of you. We just uh, for those who are watching no. the video, uh, which is uh, some of you, uh, we actually only have a still picture of him, and he's in front of some wonderful mountains and probably somewhere nearby. So anyway, that's good. And then let's also bring on Ingi Wallen. Ingi, welcome to the show. Thank you. Cool. And uh, where are you speaking to us from? Well, I'm currently back in my home in Linköping, Sweden, which is not exactly near the southern border, but more south than north. Okay, so I'm, I'll wave in your general direction, which is way over there to the east. <laughs> it's going to be a long <laughs> way. I was actually, I think, didn't did my cruise ship? We went to we went to Norway, so it's probably close to where you are. Probably not, uh, but well, finally above the Arctic Circle, while the sun was above. So I actually saw three days with no sunset, which is really, really bizarre. I'm sure you get that every year, so you really don't care, but uh, it is sort of cool. Anyway, so let's, uh, let's start with Amory. Uh, let's talk about what what problem are people solving when they're reaching for CX? Oh, uh, w when they are trying to install it? Do you mean that? No, no, no. I mean, why would somebody use CX instead of something else? Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I think that you said that uh, people can use CX to create Ethereum smart contracts. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not sure if you said that, uh, but uh, we're not using Ethereum. We're using our own cryptocurrency uh, uh, from Skycoin. It's actually called also Skycoin. So you will use CX to create something similar to smart contracts, to, to Ethereum's smart contracts, but, but for the Skycoin cryptocurrency. Uh, so a a anyone interested on using um, uh, 
uh, Skycoin, uh, we'll need to use CX to, to create these. Uh, uh, we actually call them CX chains. Um, uh, and, and well, y y you can use CX uh, to create these CX chains, and CX chains are different to Ethereum uh, smart contracts because uh, you, you can create any general purpose pr uh, uh, program. Like, for example, you could create a, a video game on CX that, that is running on, on CX, and you could add some bits of, uh, of those video games uh, to the blockchain. Uh, for example, a, a very simple example uh, will be like keeping the, the score of a video game um, uh, on the blockchain. That, that way, you can have multiple people joining your video game and, and sharing these lists of, of the scores. And they will be synchronized and in. Uh, people won't be able to tamper with uh, with that information. Well, so yeah. why, what what's what's different about blockchain that isn't just about having a database that everybody shares? Mm, well, uh, as as I as I mentioned in my email, I, I'm not a, a cryptocurrency expert, so I, I might be wrong. But uh, as far as I know, the the uh, the biggest difference with blockchains and, and normal databases are, are this uh, built-in security that you get from, from the blockchain. That you have to sign every, every block and, and you need to uh, guarantee that, that that block came from uh, a series of blockchains. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but, but, but that's the main advantage that, that I can think of. As I said, I'm not an expert. Maybe someone else could, could say. I'm I'm the developer <laughs> in here, and 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 so what you've so you're not really like the crypto guy. So what what is it that invited you or inspired you to write a, a brand new programming language just for this? Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, uh, I, one of the alternatives was to use GoLang. Uh, directly, but because Skycoin is developed uh, in Golang, but the sure. main the main advantage of creating our own programming language was a uh, freedom. Like uh, we can experiment with any ideas that we have, for example, affordances or or even the the CX chains. It would have been far more difficult to develop to develop CX chains using pure Golang, and uh, instead of using our own programming language where we can implement all our ideas. Uh, uh, for example, it, uh, we are trying to keep as close as possible uh, uh, CX to to Golang. Like we are using the same uh, syntax. Same semantics, mm -hmm. the same ideas, but if, if we want to change something, it's well, it's it's easier and, and it is possible if we are uh, doing it in our own programming language instead of, of having to change Golang, which will be it, it's not impossible. We could create a fork of Golang, but that will be uh, far uh, harder. Um, so yeah, and and so what. What would I do with all this? I mean, I still don't. I still don't know the problem space that this is solving. Can you can you give me a, a bit more hint? Um, not, not really. I, I have been focused on on developing the the programming language and integrating Skycon with that. So, uh, I, I think Inga has been doing some okay. more research about that. <laughs> okay, Inga, you want to take that question then? Yeah. Well. I, th I think I would like to take a step back before I answer your last question and, and address Please. the first one. What, uh, what is actual blockchain and what is it good yeah. for? Mm -hmm. So basically what Omeri said, uh, that it's a public ledger, uh, it's true. It's, it's nothing more than that uh, in its most basic form. And uh, the big thing about it, the big deal that makes it worthwhile is that it's not possible to, to cheat. So the, in a database, you have one central place where the database is kept, and you have one party which owns the database which can update it, and you never know as an outsider whether that party is honest or not. Sometimes you can just assume it, like for instance, if the database owner is a bank or an insurance company or something like that, but many times banks are not that honest, and uh, there are times when banks are uh, beholden to to uh, 
to governments which are not that honest and so on. So uh, I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago in Cyprus, uh, the banks were doing really badly and uh, the government decided that, yeah, we can fix this problem by just taking money from the people who have put in money into the, uh, their accounts in that bank. So they basically stole a number of percentage, uh, percentage of, of their holdings. I don't remember how much or whatever. But wow. uh, on, on the public ledger, uh, which is implemented uh, by blockchain, the blockchain is mostly a block contains a number of transactions between accounts. And when you have one block uh, and you add another block to the chain, by cryptographical means you can uh, ensure that the last uh, uh, the, the previous block was okay and since this is done uh, all the time you can be sure that up to the point where we are right now the blocks are in fact correct and uh, this is done by process where you have a number of computers on the internet which don't have to trust each other but there has to be an algorithm that makes them uh, able to either together uh, agree that all the transactions in the latest block is correct or correct or uh, that if one of them say that I have created a new block and this block is correct then the others have a means to uh, ascertain that this is true or not and that is called a consensus algorithm so basically when you have a blockchain, you only have a database, that's true, but one that is not possible to change afterwards. So you can always go back and see every transaction uh, from the very start. So if you have an application where you need to establish trust without having a trusted party, that's where you use a blockchain. Okay. Uh, so, was that clear here, or was that... That, that, that helps, but I, I'm going to ask a couple of very direct questions now, which is that sure. probably most of our audience is familiar with the whole notion of Bitcoin and all of that, what that means in terms of it's a speculation currency and uh, values have gone up and down over the years. People have made a ton of money off of it. Uh, a lot of it's not in circulation right now because apparently the uh, guy who created it has a whole bunch of Bitcoin that he has never released. Um, but but part of the problem with Bitcoin is that the cost of building uh, one of these blocks is now at the point where it takes the energy requirement of a small city for a week to be able to produce. Uh, will Skycoin eventually get to there? And if oh, so, how long and, before that happens? Yeah, so uh, you have a couple of generations of, of blockchain technology and Bitcoin was the first one. So there's an mm -hmm. algorithm or consensus called proof of work. Basically, it's a lottery uh, or uh, it's, it's very advanced guesswork. So you have to guess a number many, many, many times uh, in a second. In fact, I think it's up to trillions now per second uh, to at some point randomly arrive at one number that fits some criteria. And the idea is that if many, many computers compete to do this, then you can uh, be sure that at some point one random computer will find the number and they will then have the honor to, to uh, tell that the latest block is correct and the others have a much, much, much cheaper algorithm to check that. And uh, since uh, computers get faster and the technologies go from normal desktop computers to video uh, video cards and uh, now ASIC uh, miners uh, the speed on which with which you have to um, uh, guess these numbers are getting way way higher than they were to begin with and that's the reason why so much energy is spent but this is not the only argument that you can use to uh, to ascertain uh, that a block is correct or the only consensus algorithm. There is another one called proof of stake, so which basically means that if you want to uh, play, you stake a number of, of your coins, whatever that is, uh, and then you get the privilege to be among a few, a select few. And uh, in this group, 
you have uh, either the privilege to say if there are 10 computers in the group and every one of those have staked a quite large number of coins, then you can uh, tell, for instance, each 10th block that this is correct and the other ones will just check it. And if you lie, if they are, the others uh, find out that you have created false transactions or allowed false transactions to be uh, on the blockchain, then they can just cut you out and you will lose your stake. So if the stake is large, then you have a lot to lose by by adding uh, wrong transactions and you will thereby be kept honest. So that's another argument. And Skycoin is using a third one called uh, Obelisk. That's not fully implemented yet, so uh, I cannot show you the details. But basically, there is uh, it's called a, a web of trust. So you have something similar to uh, proof of, of uh, stake, except that the group which uh, determines if a block is, is correct changes all the time, and you don't actually have to stake anything. But if you do something which is wrong, the nearby nodes will quickly uh, determine that you're wrong and cut you out of the, the group. So there is actually an uh, academic article using lots of maths written about this, and uh, I'm sure that you can put it on your uh, on your uh, tweet page after this uh, this chat. But I don't have it ready right now, so I cannot really show you the math. But at least it's it's fairly uh, certain that it works. So uh, by using this web of trust algorithm called Obelisk, you can do basically the same work as they do in Bitcoins using proof of work, but with much, much less energy uh, usage. So I've got a question for you, Inga, and it kind of comes back to, to what we talked about initially, right? So given that background into into blockchain, which is great, thank you, by the way, um, why do we need a programming language for it? Like, like why do we need a, a dedicated programming language just for just to do things in blockchain like give us can you do, are there some examples of what you could do with yeah, sure. this that that would make it clear like oh you can do this with cx but it would be really hard to do with with python or with whatever java yeah uh, absolutely so so cx in itself is not a spectacular uh, programming language it's it's basically has the same primitives as python or whatever but uh before I answer that question, I have to to give a little bit more background because we have bitcoins. You know, it's just a blockchain. It has transaction. It has uh, uh, its accounts, so that you know that if you have one bitcoin or you have uh, uh, ten, and basically an account is just a number. Uh, it's a randomized key which you generate at the beginning of your your bitcoin life, and then you have it as long as you have bitcoins on on that account. But it's uh, accounts and transactions only. You cannot do anything automatically. And that's where Ethereum comes in because they were the first, uh, second generation uh, blockchain, which has, uh, 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 basically you can store programs on the blockchain, Hmm. uh, which means that you can have events that happens that automatically trigger something. You can have a, that's why they're called smart contracts. Because you can you, you can have two parties that independently they create uh, some event. Maybe they put some ether on on the account of the smart contract, and then they uh, use the smart contract to automatically again without trust because that's the point of blockchains, right? You don't need to have trust a trusted party. So this is all automatic, and the smart contract, which is basically just a program can run uh, automatically and do what it's supposed to do. And you can be sure that the transaction, it doesn't just have to be a transaction, can be involving other chains as well and so on, can uh, be performed without anybody having to trust anybody else. And the problem with Ethereum is that they have one blockchain. They have one blockchain on which every smart contract is added and they have like 10 or 12 i think transactions per second so when you have a popular application a popular smart contract this will just get uh, 
uh, well, <laughs> blocked, if you want. And uh, things are just too slow. And uh, if you have many uh, smart contracts on Ethereum, you will have, of course, uh, even worse blockage. So the difference between Skycoin and the technology behind Skycoin on one hand and Ethereum on the other one is that in Skycoin, every blockchain, sorry, every application, every smart contract has its own blockchain. And each individual blockchain has many, many more uh, transactions per second because you set up your own blockchain, you set up your own parameters, how big can the uh, blocks be, how many uh, blocks, uh, sorry, how many seconds is there supposed to be between the blocks and so on. So you can just customize your own blockchain to, to do whatever you like with the parameters that you want. And uh, now we get back to CX. So CX is a programming language much like Golang, but Golang is controlled by uh, Google. And uh, basically you can write any program in Golang. But what CX does in addition to this is that it puts it on the blockchain uh, in uh, a controlled way. So you always know exactly when you create a program, you, you compile it to bytecode, right? That's a well-known concept. And the bytecode is just another form of the program. But what's not standard, uh, which CX can do, is that you can take the contents of the RAM memory, uh, what we call the program state, all the variables, all the uh, data structures, and also put them on the blockchain. So you can create something which uh, is much more complex than the Ethereum language, Solidity, and you can create complex programs with complex internal state that can all be uh, stored on the blockchain. And uh, why is that a good thing? Well, because the blockchain allows you to control in, uh, in retrospect that nobody has cheated. So uh, basically, Skycoin and the, the technology behind it is faster than Ethereum. You can create CX uh, smart contracts or chain applications, CX chains, on these uh, uh on, on blockchains that you create by yourself and you can make them much, much, much faster than you can do with Ethereum. Mm. So that's, yeah. I hope that was a answer to your question. Yeah, no, it totally was. That's exactly what I was looking for because I couldn't quite get the connection um, between the two or, or why there was a need for this. And now it's becoming a lot more clear the power of putting these two together in this way um, yes. So I think it's I, I, I now I'm starting to, to get the picture and starting to understand what the importance is and what you might be able to to do with it going forward. So that's really great. Uh, I wanted to come back to Amory and ask, you know, how long have you been working on this? I think that uh, you're working on a book about it as well to help people understand it. What was the um, how long has this been in progress? And, you know, what were some of the obstacles that you had to overcome to to get CX up and running? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, CX started uh, around two years ago, actually in, in June 2017. Yeah, um, I initially it, it was supposed to be a, a small programming language. Um, I was requested to create uh, something similar to Lisp. Um, I think in the in the beginning it, 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 it well, I'm I'm not totally sure about this, but I, I think that it wasn't really supposed to be integrated to to Skycoin's blockchain. Uh, but but the project began growing in size. Um, uh, th then I, I I started creating like all the all the programming behind the language, like the the um, how to call it, like, like CX Core, like uh, everything that is going to be handling the the, the call stack, the memory, etc. And 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 the syntax was later requested to to become uh, similar to GoLang syntax. Um, uh, so the the first year was focused only on on developing all the. Um, all the main ideas, all the necessary components, but uh, at a prototype stage. Um, then uh, th the first milestone, in my in my opinion, was when when people started creating video games using CX. Uh, that was a very 
exciting moment for me at least uh, because I, I was seeing people uh, creating these they are very small video games but it was still exciting like a Tetris clone a Pac-Man clone etc and and after that uh, we just focused on on improving everything like uh, fixing bugs uh, improving the error reporting of the language uh, implementing more types etc and it was just it was around six months ago, I think, in, in back in January, uh, when we started uh, developing CX chains. So at the moment, it, it's it's a prototype. It needs far. Uh, it needs more development. Uh, there are some bugs that we need to 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 fix. Uh, some features that we need to implement, but we we already have that prototype. Um, uh, Wait, this was a question, right? <laughs> am I or or am I answering something else now? <laughs> oh, this is this is great. In fact, no, I was just looking at your. Um, if you it, for people that uh, want to follow up on this, if you go to the link that's in the lower third there for you guys, the uh, GitHub link, you'll see there's actually a development roadmap um, for CX, and it kind of outlines some of the things that you've done um, in the past. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things I notice on here, which is kind of interesting, like the last thing in 2019 that you have on here is development of video games using the Skycoin blockchain. Um, and that kind of alludes to some of the things that you were, you were talking about earlier, I think. But what I love about this is you don't typically see a detailed roadmap like this. Uh, there it is. You can see it there kind of go going over some of the points that you just made, um, uh, you know, first Alva version of the language was in 2018. So this is still, we should point out, I mean, this is still very new. We're not at 1.0 yet, right? I'm sorry? At last well, you, haven't, uh, you haven't released a, a 1.0 version of this. Oh, we, we started at uh, 0.5, I think. Why? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, I think we, we started with the versioning uh, when we were already uh, somewhat advanced. Uh, with the project, actually, uh, I, I was creating something like a mess of of the project, and Inge uh, came in into the project, and he, he's he he has far more experience in project uh, management than me, and and he was surprised that we we, we didn't have a, a versioning system, that we, we didn't have many uh, uh, necessary things that that I now understand that those are necessary for big projects like uh, release notes uh, or cre creating milestones for the for the box um, and for the issues and the, and the features uh, so uh, when we started versioning the the, the project we, we decided to start at 0.5 and currently we, we are at uh, 0.7. Uh, so soon we were going to release 0.7.1 which is going to include some uh, bug fixes and and features for the CX chains. Very cool, very cool. So people should just be aware that you know this is still essentially in beta, um, but it looks like people are doing some cool stuff with it. I'm just kind of curious, what um, have, have you had? It sounds like this is somewhat new for you to be writing a language like this. What's your background? I mean, how did you do? You have background in developing programming languages. Uh, no, I I was a web developer before this. Actually, when I I began programming, uh, well, my first programming language was PHP. Uh, I have been a web developer for like more than ten years, uh, but but I have always been very very interested in programming language uh, design. Um, I I began learning about more programming languages and I was interested in how pr these different programming languages differ uh, among them, uh, how they managed memory, etc. So, so I was uh, familiar with all of these concepts and how, uh, how uh, you can build your own programming language. Um, and my, my favorite programming language is Lisp uh, and it's, it's almost a tradition for anyone interested in these uh, programming languages to, to develop your own pro your own Lisp. Uh, so I had some experience with pro uh, programming language design, but uh, but my first real uh, big project was CX. So uh, I had the opportunity to implement um, 
some of, of the ideas that I, I, I have in, in the past, like for example, in affordances, I, I, I talked with, uh, with my boss, he was interested on, on, on these, uh, uh, this mechanism called affordances, but uh, uh, most of the design uh, uh, affordances come from some of my ideas. Obviously, I discussed these ideas with, with, uh, with my boss, but he agreed on, on those ideas. And actually, if, if anyone who's listening to this uh, webcast is familiar with Lisp, uh, affordances are very similar to, to Lisp macros, but in my opinion, they, they are uh, a little bit more uh, uh, powerful than, than Lisp macros. So, yeah, so I, I have never had a, a formal job related to, to programming language design, but I, I have always been interested on this field. Well, I'm definitely going to have to ask you some more questions about affordances because I'm actually also a Lisp expert, uh, but uh, we'll get into that uh, right after this very important message because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Deploy and scale your app seamlessly on the simplest cloud platform. Save your team time when you deploy with DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is trusted by over 1 million developers. They make it simple to launch in the cloud and scale up as you grow. Whether you're running one virtual machine or 10,000, Spin up a virtual machine in just 55 seconds. Standard, general purpose, or CPU optimized configurations provide flexibility to build, test, and grow your application. DigitalOcean has over 2,000 open source tutorials with an easy to use control panel and API that lets developers spend more time coding and less time managing their infrastructure. Modernize your cloud infrastructure fast with DigitalOcean's Marketplace, a diverse catalog of pre configured one click apps. CloudBees, LAMP, Ghost, cPanel, Node.js, Jenkins, WordPress, and many more. DigitalOcean offers simple, predictable pricing. Always know what you'll pay with monthly caps and flat pricing across all data centers. Included at no additional cost. 24-7, 365 world-class support. Monitoring and alerts. 99.99% uptime SLA. Team accounts. Full DNS management. 12 global data centers. DigitalOcean is on a mission to simplify cloud computing so developers and their teams can spend more time building software that changes the world. Go to do.co slash twit today to sign up and receive a free $50 credit. That's do.co slash twit for a free $50 credit. DigitalOcean, designed for developers, built for businesses. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support of Floss Weekly. So talk to me about affordances. You said it's like a, it's like a macro in, in Lisp. I don't understand that. Uh, yeah. So, in in the, you said that you you have experience with Lisp. Yes. Ah, I like you more already. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait! Before, before we get too much further, then I'll, I'll give you my credential for that. I wrote the pretty printer in Emacs Lisp, and Richard Stallman called it brilliant, which is why he includes it in their distribution. So there's a little piece of me in every copy of Emacs. Oh wow! So, so you're a, you're a legend, basically. <laughs> <laughs> on many levels, on many levels, we don't have time to go on a lot. Let's talk about the, what, what the what the heck is an affordance? Please tell me about this. Okay, so uh, well, the, the the basic idea behind macros is that you can have like programs that that are writing programs, right? Like you're going to sure. be uh, yeah. Okay, so so affordances are going to be doing the same. You you can have these programs that are going to be creating programs. Actually, the the, the first application that I created using affordances to to test uh, this mechanism was a, mm -hmm. a uh, I was going to say genetic. Oh yeah, yeah, genetic program. Uh, I created a genetic programming algorithm. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with that. Uh, oh, yeah. But but basically, we we, we had CX. Uh, creating these small programs uh, in order to find a solution to a, to a problem, uh, but uh, well, the, at, at this point, I, I consider affordances uh, to be well uh, at least similar to list macros. But later on, uh, we we expanded ma uh, affordances to to have uh, access to like meta information about about the programming language. For example, uh, uh, if you wanted to create uh, uh, a function in 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 a CX program when the heap uh, reaches certain size. I, I'm not sure what what will 
that well, what will be a, an application for that but you can do that in CX uh, you, you can be querying how much memory left you have uh, in a CX program and you could create a function or you could do, uh, remove a function or or, or something like that uh, and a actually I'm um, we haven't uh, implemented yet aff affordances for for CX chains, but one of the ideas is that we can use affordances uh, to to check what's the state of the CX program in order to determine if if a user is going to have access to to some function calls. Like if, uh, a CX program can be aware of of who is calling uh, the, uh, certain functions, and uh, given certain conditions, you can uh, determine if if that user is going to be able to run that function or not um mm. uh, but but that that's for uh, for the particular case of of six chains and as a more uh, i always try to to focus on the general general perspective of uh, of it because I, I am designing the the programming language I, i'm not focused on on certain fields but uh but yeah in, in affordances you, you can use all this meta information to yeah, just imagine like it's it's macros with access to more information about the, the uh, about the program like in in a list macro you could uh, for example compile the run the macro if, if, if the list uh, is a certain size uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, I'm thinking about that but in affordances you you could ask um I don't know um, that do you want to run a certain function only if um, if if certain number of, of functions have been created? I, again, I, I'm I'm not I'm not sure what what will be an application for that, but you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you've added some level of introspection, which is uh, sometimes dangerous, but sometimes really really cool. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. So so. CX's primary target is is the Skycoin blockchain. Do you see a um, you have a vision for it being also outside that, just being used as a general purpose programming language? Just being used as a general purpose language, like yeah. uh, not not using any of the Skycoin technologies. Yeah, well, well, actually, CX started like that. Um, you can just use CX to create a video game, for example, or or a script. Uh, a scripting program, but uh, you could totally ignore all the aspects of the of the blockchain. But but yeah, the, the main feature uh, is these uh, CX chains. Okay, uh, Iggy, want to get you back in the conversation here a little bit. So you say you're the like the project leader, the the, the managing whatever guy, the the head who Puba or whatever, right? Um, so what's what's been the most difficult thing in bringing a new programming language into existence for you? Well, as a project, this is uh, not a very big one. I, I manage at my day job. Uh, a project which has 24,000 developer hours. Uh, so this is not <laughs> <Okay>. very big. <laughs> uh, what, what has been a, a bit of a challenge is to, to get into the code because it's, it's pretty complicated. Uh, as you probably know, if you have implemented a programming language before, it not only involves a parser and, uh, and uh, runtime uh, or Bitcoin generator. Sorry. <laughs> Bytecode generator, not Bytecoin. Yes. Uh, it also involves memory management and uh, and a garbage collector and so on. So so it's quite complicated. Uh, Amari is very very good with the code. He can quickly find issues and bugs. And uh, there are some really complex uh, interactions between different parts of the uh, CX interpreter. And and he always manages to find the uh, to find uh, what's wrong in the end. But uh, as a general programming project, it's not very complicated to manage at all. I just added uh, some well-known methods of, of uh, open source with using issue trackers, and uh, uh, he mentioned uh, uh, milestones. We have well-defined uh, targets for, for releases, which issues are we going to fix now and which are we going to wait with until later. And uh, all of that is just standard practice in, in, in programming projects, I think. And so what's this written in? 
CX itself is written in Golang. Okay. Okay, good. I could sort of, I sort of guessed that, but I'm just kind of waiting to see uh, what you guys actually say. So, how do you test something like this? Do you have a a, a big test suite that can make sure you don't regress yeah. on yeah, bugs we, or we have, make sure that it's extended? Yeah. Yeah, we we have two types of tests right now. We have uh, so-called regression tests, which means that every time somebody uh, uh, register an issue or a bug, if you like. Uh, then we mm -hmm. create a test for it to show that, yeah, there is indeed a problem. And then when we fix the bug, the test goes from non-passing to passing, and everybody's happy. And then we keep that test forever. So that particular problem will never come back. Uh, so that's one type of test we have. Then we have uh, unit tests for different parts of uh, of the internals of CX. And... Uh, and, and uh, uh, product tests or, or black box tests for some parts of the language so that we set up, for instance, uh, just to pick an example, we have one test file with lots and lots of tests for uh, uh, mathematical expressions, uh, floating point, integer, and so on. We have another file which tests uh, control structures like if and for and, uh, and uh, switch and break and so on so every time there is a new problem uh, we we try to just write a test before we write the code that fixes the problem w one thing that is still a bit lacking is that we don't have uh, unit tests or, or black box tests that cover all of the language and that's something we're working on to to make more complete do you have like a, a fake version of skycoin then to Test uh, the the parts of it that where CX actually touches the uh, the contracts. Uh, well, basically no. We do have a few tests, but they are the most lacking part right now. Uh, integration of of CX into the blockchain touches more code repositories than than just the CX repo. So we have a copy of the Skycoin uh, basic Skycoin. Uh, uh, repository where we do all our modifications and that, that will later be moved back into the main Skycoin repository. But right now okay. that is an area where we need many, many more tests. Definitely. And how would you contrast the Skycoin contract versus say an Ethereum contract? Is it about the same level of semantics in terms of capability and, and, and spread or is, there, or is the Skycoin one a lot more powerful? Okay, so I'm, I'm not a Solidity developer. Uh, Solidity is the programming okay. language of Ethereum. Uh, so I can't answer that question in detail. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that since we have a, a general programming language, which also has uh, which also has applications outside of the blockchain and also in the born boundary between blockchain and outside the blockchain, mm -hmm. I, I think it may actually be uh, more general, but since I'm not uh, very well familiar with Solidity itself, I, I cannot really answer that in detail. Sorry. I understand. That's fine. And also, so is Skycoin a speculated monetary value similar to Bitcoin, or are they totally different things? Well, okay, so, so I already outlined the differences in, in technology. For instance, the consensus yeah. algorithm, Sky, uh, Obelisk versus proof of work. So sure. basically, I haven't been in blockchains extremely long. I mean, the founders of Skycoin have been there since 2011. That's from the very, very beginning. They, some of them even worked on, on uh, Bitcoin to begin with. But what I have come to understand is that they, there are uh, some some blockchain or some uh, coins which have utility and some which are just general copies of Bitcoin with some uh, maybe intended use, but which is basically interchangeable with any other uh, crypto coin. And the big use case for uh, Skycoin is uh, the system called Skywire. So there is going to be a mesh net 
the, the founders of Skycoin, they don't uh, really trust the current internet because, as you well know, uh, ISPs, they sell your data, who you're connecting to, and, and they sometimes even read the connections between you and the servers and, and read what contents is being uh, transferred. They sell that data to advertisers and they, they uh, uh, deliver data to, uh, to governments. And some governments can handle that, but most cannot, and so on. And uh, basically what they want to do is to create a new internet which is built up from small uh, nodes uh, which connect to each other and everything is encrypted all the time. And the way that this will be paid for by the end users is uh, using a feature of Skycoin called Coin Hours. So basically, there is a limited amount of, of Skycoins, namely 100 millions of them. And every hour that you uh, hold a Skycoin, you will get assigned a so-called Coin Hour. So if you have 100 Skycoins and you hold them for one hour, you will have 100 Coin Hours. And uh, this is much like gas, for instance, on, on the Ethereum network. So you have one currency, which is the base currency, and you have another currency, which is derived from it, and which is then used for transaction costs. So right now, the coin hours are used for paying for transactions on the Skycoin uh, blockchain, and it will be used to pay for internet access on the Skywire uh, network. And since people will hopefully uh, want to to have very good internet which is also secure uh, they will want to pay for it and uh, therefore they will need to buy sky coins so that they will get the coin hours to pay for the actual services is that the answer to your question or yeah, I think I think that does answer the question. But now my mind just went. <laughs> you can probably tell by my expression <laughs> when John cut the camera to me. I'm like trying to process all this about Skywire now as well. Um, so Sky, basically, <clears throat> I, I can get back to my what I was originally saying. I think there is a big, big, big difference between uh, cryptocurrencies that have uh, an application, a utility, and which mm-hmm. is tailored to that utility. And those that do not have that, Bitcoin does not have that. So, for instance, if you have uh, just the Skycoin uh, blockchain, it could easily just replace Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a slow variation of of Skycoin, if you want to describe Uh, it that way. But uh, the other way is not true. So if you have, for instance, a Skycoin, which indirectly pays for services on Skywire, you have something which is not interchangeable with anything else. And that's what what builds value in the long run. Right. So that's why I think that Skycoin will actually be successful where many, many others will not. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I'm going to have to do a little digging on Skycoin now. It's got me interesting both in, uh, it's one of those episodes where I got interested in both CX and in Skycoin. Let me, let me just ask you one quick question, um, sure. just in terms of examples. I mean, what would you say is the most interesting example that you've seen someone do so far, at least with CX? Well, uh, you have to remember that CX chains are, are just a month old. So before that, there mm-hmm. was no way to interact with the blockchain. So before that, there were uh, earlier releases of CX. And uh, Amari mentioned that there were some uh, video games, simple ones, based on it. It has an, uh, uh, it has a connection. There, there's a package. It's a CX term called a package, just like Golang, uh, for OpenGL. And many, there's a few uh, uh, applications written with CX uh, using uh, OpenGL for for uh, the video graphics. I think there's a Tetris. There is a, a clone of uh, crappy uh, Flappy Birds. There is a clone of uh, of uh, <laughs> now. Yeah, I saw Pac Man, and I saw um, yeah, exactly. Pac Man was, uh, was Snake. Really- I, I tried to get both of them up and running. I happen to be running Windows, and they both crashed, unfortunately. I wanted to get one of them up before uh, we wrapped up here, but I, they just didn't work. And I'm I haven't got it. I'm trying to set up um, to see if I can get this running on a Raspberry Pi as well to see if I can get it running there. But um, let me throw it back over to Omri real quick. Uh, what, what, just before it, you do you that, agree with I, that? I just want yeah, sure. Just 
just before you do that, I want to uh, give you a tip. There is a guy uh, who is creating a game creation toolkit called CXFX, and you should look that up. There are some really impressive demos of that. CXFX. Okay, I'll look it up. Yes. For sure. Yes. Yeah, this CXFX. sounds exciting. Um, Omri, just real quick before Randall comes back in, any really interesting examples that you want to point out that come to mind? Well, the, the, the most interesting examples actually are like uh, like Inga mentioned at uh, CXFX. It's, it's not an application, but, but it's a, a library for creating video games. And I have seen the demos, and, and the guy that, that is creating these libraries is, is very impressive. The, uh, all all of his work has been really impressive so far. Uh, th there was also someone who was creating a machine learning library for, for CX, and I, I was excited about that because that that's my 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 field actually. But, uh, I started a master's and a PhD on machine learning, so I was really excited to see someone that, uh, developing a, a machine learning uh, library for it. Uh, he created, I think, uh, um, a prototype of uh, neural networks for, for CX. And, and we were talking actually about uh, storing these uh, neural networks on the, on the blockchain. Uh, that, that will be really cool because uh, actually, I, I frequently bring this topic in the in the channels, but I guess as as almost no one knows that much about machine learning, they they are not they they don't get very excited about it. But uh, we could uh, store neural networks on on the blockchain or other um, uh, prediction models or or, or or other algorithms in there, and, and we could have uh, people. Uh, uh, running these models, uh, training these models in their computers. Uh, for example, I could uh, take one of these models and train it for uh, 1,000 generations. I, uh, uh, just um, uh, to simplify it, uh, I could bring, uh, I could um, give some computing power uh, in order to train a better model, a, a better a prediction model, uh, and that updated model could be updated by someone else. So it, you have this decentralized um, uh, training algorithm. Uh, but anyway, but, but yeah, back to the question. Uh, I found that project to be very interesting. And um, CXFX, uh, oh, and, and, and someone else was developing a, a linear, uh, no, was it that? It, it, it was just called like CX, Math, or I, I don't know if Inga remembers about that. It was creating some some uh, math uh, like linear algebra um, uh, functions for CX. But I, wow. I find I find those projects to be more interesting than than the video games, maybe because of my background. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're almost out of time, really. I mean, the hour goes by so fast when we're talking about really complex subjects like this. So this is uh, it's been wonderful having the both of you on. Uh, I do have one major final question and then a couple little minor final questions to ask each of you. Uh, we've talked about a lot of different things, but is there anything we've not asked you yet that you want to make sure our audience is aware of before we have to let you go? We'll start with uh, Amri. Um, I can't really think about something. I'm pretty sure that, that, that <laughs> after the webcast, I, I will be like, oh, God damn, <laughs> they could have uh, asked it. It always happens. It, 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 you're not unusual. It's always that way. And Inge, same, same, same question? Yeah, well, we, we have been talking a lot of uh, about technology and, and how it's built up and what it's used for and so on. But I think that uh, when it comes to um, uh, marketing and, and things like that, we, we haven't talked anything about it. So where is actually CX being used? Is it just hackers? No, in fact, uh, the Skycon founder uh, company has had a lot of success in, in talking with, uh, especially Chinese government for some reason. And uh, there's going to be a lot of Chinese uh, universities which will offer courses in, in CX and blockchain programming. So basically, they selected CX as the uh, blo blockchain technology to teach. And that will, of course, create uh, a big growth once the students come out into the real world. That's what I think. Wow. 
That's impressive. That's actually pretty cool. Um, uh, now I'm worried about tariffs, but let's just shut up about politics for this show. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's the way it gets. Uh, two more, two more final questions. Uh, since you're both uh, hackers of some kind, uh, what's your favorite programming language, and what's your favorite text editor? We'll start with Amory first. Oh well, I, I already answered that. I think it, it's Lisp. I, I'm yes. I'm also interested in other programming languages like Ford. But actually, if if it's a programming language that it's kind of weird, <laughs> I, I I'm usually interested in that. But but yeah, by far it's Lisp, and I use Emacs to to hack <laughs> almost everything. <laughs> A winner, yeah. a winner. All right, all right. Like I told you, there's a little copy, of, a little bit of me in every single copy of GNU Emacs. So I'm very happy by that. And there wasn't a pretty printer before I came along, but I'd been playing with that with, um, what was the Lisp out of uh, Berkeley? Berkeley Lisp, I think it was called, the original, like, big Lisp. Uh, there was a pretty printer in that, and then there wasn't one in Emacs Lisp. And sorry, that's why I wrote one. And, and like I said, Richard Stallman called it brilliant. So I, I appreciate that. And I, I like that you also mentioned Forth. Uh, one of my friends was one of the senior uh, Forth developers and did a bunch of stuff. In fact, one of the things he did is an actual project. I'm, I'm running over time here now. I should, should be shutting up. Is uh, he worked for government, uh, for military. And in Desert Storm, when all the tanks would turn in synchronization, so like there was one tank that was actually leading everything, but the rest were all sort of slave to that. That was actually a fourth program that was running in those mm -hmm. tanks, and he wrote that. So he was like so amazed when he saw this happening <laughs> on the screen. He goes, I did that. I wrote that, and it's in fourth. <laughs> so, so yeah, so there's your, there's your tip, tip of the hat to fourth as well. Uh, and all right, Inge, same two questions? Before we run out of time. Yeah, well, uh, there's actually only one answer to what what text editor are using. And that's of course Emacs. Yay! And, uh, another one. Another one. <laughs> Yay! Right. Another win. And I also have some code in in the standard distribution of Emacs. I, I wrote an Elisp library uh, huh? at one point in in my early cool. days. So if you look at Elib, I think there's okay. a package called that inside the the Emacs distribution. So awesome. Awesome. I always, uh, sorry, I also have uh, Lisp as my favorite programming language, even though I'm working in Golang now and have previously worked in, in uh, C++ for a long time. But Lisp awesome. is the one that I think is most productive. Yes, yes. There are many There are many reasons I spent a lot of years doing stuff with Lisp. I was using that as my favorite scripting language for a while. I'd write little Elisp programs to do my text processing until Perl came along. And when Perl came along, it was all much nicer in Pearl, but that's a long historical story. So, guys, thank you both for coming on the show, talking about CX, talking a bit about Skycoin, uh, trying to explain. There it is. Oops, there's the dogs. Okay, so I knew I was trying to get it done before the dogs started barking, but apparently I did not succeed. So thank you once again, Omri and uh, and Ingi, for coming on the show and talking about this. You're welcome. See you. It was a pleasure. Awesome. So that was uh, Amory uh, Hernandez Aguila and Ingi Wallen talking to us about CX. What do you think there, sir? Yeah, pretty cool. I'm uh, I'm still uh, working as they were talking on getting this set up on my Raspberry Pi. Um, the uh, So it's one of those episodes, again, where you want to try it, right? Like, that's what I'm doing now. Yep. And also, it's more interesting than I thought it was going to be. Like, uh, yes. once we got to the point where we were talking about the application and I understood what the the connection was between blockchain and CX. Then it, all of a sudden it was like you know the you know the light bulb went off. It was like oh okay now all of a sudden this is really cool. Like I, yes. I, I want to get in and I want to see how this works and what you could do with it. And it sounds like there's some some you know some nice projects that are being developed. Um, the ML stuff is is really interesting. The graphics program which you wouldn't actually uh, uh, the graphics library I should say which you wouldn't think of being. I mean, of course, in a programming language, every programming language should have a good graphics library. But you just wouldn't you wouldn't pick that application, I wouldn't think, naturally. But the fact that someone's working right. on it means someone's interested in it. Um, and so I want to check that out. So overall, I think this is really, really interesting. And I hope people um, at least dabble with it, support it. The documentation is pretty good. The, there's examples, which you kind of have to dig for a little bit. But if you go through the documentation, you can find the examples. You can find the examples of Pac-Man and everything else that you want to run, um, right. which are which are good examples in and of themselves, right? Uh, because all the code is open. So um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to play with it a little bit. I, it's not going to become my, you know, until I can come up with a really good application for it. Of course, I'm not going to dive in too deep, but I at least want to test it out because it looks really cool. 
Cool. And I appreciate the fact that both of these guys dabble in Lisp and both use Emacs <laughs> still, which is really a win for me. I didn't hear the word Perl except for when I said it. So it's uh, it's nice that way, though. But uh, yeah, I used to do a whole bunch of my stuff in Emacs Lisp as, as little scripts written in Emacs Lisp, which is really sort of weird. And also for those of you who are longtime Perl fans, uh, the Schwartzian transform actually came from my work in Lisp, where I had essentially the decorate, sort, undecorate pattern from Lisp. I just copied that to make that uh, the switching transform in Perl. So it's nothing new, but I got my name attached to it. Not by me. I didn't. I'm not that vain. I'm not that vain. Uh, another another fellow Perl trainer of mine uh, also uh, invented that. Anyway, so let's talk about what's coming up because we're really running over time now. Micronaut is next week. That's a modern JVM-based full-stack framework for building modular, easily testable microservice and serverless applications. The following week, I will be at OSCON. Uh, I've got uh, Rachel, oh, God, I murdered her last name, Romuliotis. Sorry, Rachel. Uh, Rachel uh, has been on the show a couple times before. I'm actually going to be interviewing her on site in Portland at OSCON to talk about what's new this year, what are the big innovations, and all that sort of stuff. Might be preempted if uh, with somebody else if there's actually a big announcement happening, and I'll know that Monday or Tuesday. But uh, otherwise, Rachel's on the show doing a great time with us. Uh, Justin Riach is going to be after that. Uh, we haven't picked the topic yet. He's... Uh, He's given me a laundry list of things he's an expert in, of free versus open source, modern enterprise built on open source. That's his company actually provides uh, consulting services for open source software. So if you really need to have somebody else doing your support work for you, you can hire them to do that for you, which is a really great project. And why Floss is more secure? Because there are more eyes looking at it. And what the heck are neural networks and why TensorFlow is amazing? So a lot of great topics. He just came back from a conference. We're going to be talking about what his topic is going to be. And then following up, the only other thing we have on the schedule right now, which means it's time to send out a thousand emails, is Serverless Framework, which is an easy, easy, uh, enable, easy deploy for serverless apps. We're looking forward Ooh. to that. You can, you can go to the uh, go to the uh, big spreadsheet uh, linked from the homepage for the show, twitter.tv slash floss. And uh, if you go to that spreadsheet and you see uh, on there that there aren't the people you want on there, well, here's how to get that to happen. You talk to the project leader or the community coordinator and have them email me, merlin at stonehenge.com. My address is on that page. And for write it down, just have to know twit.tv slash floss. That's the only thing you need to know. And go right to there. We have a live stream at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays at live to twit.tv. I don't know if we took any questions this time from there. Wasn't wasn't a lot of activity. Well, we always take a number of questions. Sometimes the number is zero. <laughs> that would be today. <laughs> <laughs> you can follow us at Atfloss Weekly on Twitter, and eventually uh, I'm going to get a medium.com uh, publication that you'll be able to link to and follow on that. You can follow me and at Merlin on Twitter, M-E-R-L-Y-N. I'm going to be, again, at OSCON in just a few weeks, uh, hanging out with Rachel or whoever else is announcing something this week or that week. I'm going to be at DragonCon in Atlanta on Labor Day weekend. I'm going to be giving my Flutter talk. I'm going to build an entire app that will run simultaneously on iOS, Android, uh, desktop, and um, uh, web, all from the same code base. It's going to be amazing. If it works, it's a live demo. Don't tell the demo gods. Okay, and, uh, and I'm going to be at uh, All Things Open in mid-October, and I'm just uh, pressed there. Uh, by the way, they've given us a, a discount code. If you go to their site, allthingsopen.org, and you enter the code Floss Weekly all lowercase, you will get the cheapest possible rate right now. And that's good until the day of the show. But please sign up soon so that they can know how many people have that. Uh, anything you want to plug there, uh, Aaron? Uh, actually, there's not a lot. I mean, go go buy my book. Uh, it's up there. I'm not going to bring it down. Go buy my book, <laughs> Linux for Makers, or, or recommend it if you're already an expert on Linux command line and, and file systems and what to do. It's a nice overview for people that are just getting started with Raspberry Pi, just getting their feet wet with Linux. Really gives them a chance to kind of figure out like what the heck is going on because that's uh, how everybody feels when they first dip their toes into the water of Linux. But uh, yeah, go check out uh -huh. that. And uh, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. You're busy. I'm like taking the summer off, apparently. I, you know, I, I have to be busy though because I have to have my face in front of people, and I also have to be scouting for new Floss Weekly projects, uh, which seems to be most of what I do at conferences these days. So yeah. uh, hopefully at Oscon, I'm going to find a couple more um, because I've got some slots in the schedule. Time to get filled. Uh, uh, D Digimax in the chat room says, "What's the name of the book?" Oh, it's called Linux for Makers. Linux ah, for Makers. Cool. Just go look it up on Amazon or look up my name on Amazon. You'll find it. 
And where's my autographed copy? You were going to send me an autographed copy, weren't you? Oh, uh, next time we're together, um, <laughs> as we often Just are. Kidding. Not. Uh, we really room. aren't. <laughs> Unless you're coming yeah. up to Oscon. Are you coming up to Oscon? No, I'm not, but I should. I really should. It's um, a it's a it's an expensive place to go to unless you've got like the zero cost discounts like yeah, I do. Yeah, some sort of corporate sponsorship or something. But yeah, I'll get yeah. there eventually. One of these days. Uh, all right. We're running way over. So thank you once again, Aaron, for uh, stopping by and helping me out, uh, giving me a chance to let the dogs bark in the background with, with my mic muted. And uh, thank you much once again. Yeah, sure. No problem. Anytime. Awesome. awesome, Aaron. Thank you. And thank you all. We'll see you again next week on Floss Weekly. 